Once again, taking your Bibles and turning to Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to start at verse 1. Bear with me as we go through this. Uh, I think it's important that we read this and uh, just uh, try to put yourself in the situation and not listen to me read. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. I understand that Daniel is reading Jeremiah. Jeremiah was before Daniel, so Jeremiah's experienced some things, and Daniel is, is actually contemplating, and he is meditating on what Jeremiah had wrote. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princesses, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges and judged us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For he obeyed not for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renowned as at this day we have sinned. 
we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear upon thine eyes Hear, excuse me, and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolation and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not from thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. The title of the message this morning is 70 Years of Captivity. 70 Years of Captivity. The reason I bring this to you this morning is because we are seeing the same thing unfold in America. It's happening right now before our eyes. This is prophecy that has been told us. These closing chapters contain in Daniel some of the most detailed prophecies in the Bible. And most of them have already been fulfilled. But yet there are some yet to unfold. So we want to focus our attention in chapter 9 because an understanding of Daniel's 70 weeks is basic to Bible prophecy. This chapter deals with two different periods of time as related to the Jews. So those are the two things we're going to be covering. We've got two points this morning, the prophecy and the prayer. That's what we're going to cover. Now, there is a lot of scripture and a lot of I'm not going to use, but I will lead you to that and that you can, some of it will read, some of it I'd like you to read on your own, especially that in Jeremiah. The first point this morning is found in verses 1 and 2, the prophecy. Daniel was a student of the Old Testament scriptures, particularly those prophecies that related to the destiny of his people. You have to understand Daniel's in captivity, right? He was taken from his home. He was taken from his country, and he's thrown in this strange, barbaric, you know, evil People and he is living amongst them along with some of the others. He was now nearly 90 years old. He was reading Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 14, which you can read, but you'll see a lot of the scriptures there in Jeremiah is what Daniel's already said here in chapter 9. So we won't read that, but you can read it on your own. And the Lord caused him to see that his people would be in Babylon for 70 years. It's a long time to be, I mean, you know, I'm just going to be a little over 70 years now. So that's, that's a long time to be away from your home, your country, and, and you know, be in this strange, barbaric land. We want to note that God does not give people visions and dreams. When he can teach them through his word. Uh, some of the things that are happening today, it's uh, apparent that uh, <laughs> there's a controversy going on about that. Whether you can interpret dreams and things of that nature. We don't need to do that anymore. We have the word of God. Everything's there. Everything's explained to us. Everything we can see in the word of God. Today that we know that why we don't need visions and dreams again is his spirit teaches us through the word. All we have to do is be faithful, read the word of God and do it in the spirit. 
I mean, I've had people come to me and say, you know, I didn't understand a certain doctrine. I didn't understand, you know, well, like uh, election. They didn't understand election. And they just finally decided to, you know, put away their stubbornness and say, I prayed, I asked God to show me, I read it and he showed me and now I understand it. So that's what we have to do when it comes to, you know, looking through the scriptures. Beware of new revelations that are supposed to come from dreams and visions. Doesn't happen anymore. Daniel realized that the 70 years of captivity were about to close. So you have to understand it started basically with Jeremiah. Jeremiah seen the destruction. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar told the king of Israel at that time when they were overrun by Babylon, he told the king before he put out his eyes, he said, you should have listened to Jeremiah. Here's a heathen king telling the king of Jerusalem of Israel, you should have listened to Jeremiah. You should have listened to your own prophet. Now, if you read Jeremiah, you'll see that Jeremiah, you know, he didn't want no part of what God wanted him to do. He wasn't interested. He said, I can't do what you're asking me to do. I'm a child. How can I do this? He said, don't tell me you're a child. He said, before you were born, I knew you, you know. He said, I called you to be a prophet. Well, the prophets are out here and they're telling the king one thing and you're wanting me to tell them different. He said, they're not my prophets. They have no allegiance to me. They're telling the king what the king wants to hear, not what I'm telling you to tell them and the king. So they went back to the king, basically, and I'm paraphrasing all this whole book of Jeremiah. And he went back. He told the king and the, the prophets of the king says, that's false. That's not what we know. So they put him in jail. They imprisoned Jeremiah. And then Israel was overrun with the ba Babylonians. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar told him, he said, you should have listened. You should have listened. So Daniel's in this captivity as well. Babylon invaded Palestine and began its siege in 606 BC. And Daniel understood the prophecy in the year of 539 to 538 BC. So there were but two years left in the 70 years promised by Jeremiah. I would imagine that Daniel's getting excited. Except Daniel's 90 years old, you know, and his time is about come up. But he, I'm, he may be praying and saying, oh, Lord, help me and keep me until I get to see the restoration of Israel, Jerusalem, my people. So what an exciting time Daniel had in his Bible study that day. So you need to read, go in and read Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 1 through 14. You'll find some very interesting things in there. And it wasn't for time's sake we'd read it, but I have other ones I want to be able to read to you. So that's the prophecy. Daniel understands the prophecy. He understands what's going to happen, what's going, to, what's going on. And, and he's lived his life in Babylon, but he's lived his life concerning God. He didn't go and take on the the gods of the heathens. He kept true and faithful to his God. And that's why God was so uh, blessed to him, showered him with blessings beyond measure. So this, this, the second point I want to make this morning is found in chapter verse 3 through the end of the chapter, which we've already read, verse 19. Uh, not the rest of the chapter, but verse 3 through 19. It is the prayer, the prayer that Daniel is praying here. The word of God and prayer go together. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, 
but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's what the early church did. They were being persecuted. And the only thing that they had was to stay in the word of God and pray. All we have today is to stay in the word of God and pray. You know, all this other foolishness needs to be cast aside. You know, you want to have visions and dreams, then, you know, keep it to yourself, I think. You know, it doesn't fit here. It shouldn't be here. We have the uh, completed word of God for sure. Now, it's not to say that we're not going to dream. We all dream. But when it comes to the prophecies, why do we need to? Why is there new prophecy? There is no new prophecies. There's no new revelation. You know, when I was working, I remember there, you know, some of the people that were churchgoers, they bring in pamphlets and everything. Oh, come, you know, listen to this prophet. Well, he, he's going to charge you. He's going to charge you to hear him say what you already know is in the Bible. So it's no new, new, new revelation. He's just going to, he's just going to bring it out, but he's getting paid for. It, so that's his, that's his job. That's his hobby, so to speak. And he's getting paid for something we already know. See, all we have to do is get in there and look and we'll know it. So Daniel did not go out of and boast about his insight into the word. In fact, he did not even preach a sermon about what he's talking about here. What he did do is he went to his knees in prayer. So when we get our, find ourselves in a bad situation, which America is in a bad situation, that's what we need to do. We need to get to our knees and we need to ask for forgiveness. And I was pointing out in the, the voice paper there, there is a thing in there it said uh, uh, that uh, you need to be revived. You can't revive unless you repent. Because you're not in the situation for revival. You're in the situation of repentance. Daniel's not asking for revival. He's asking for repentance and forgiveness of his people. So he went to his knees in prayer. This is the true attitude of the humble Bible student. If you're sincere and you're willing to see God make some changes, if he, if he will, then you need to go to him in prayer. And it's sad to see prophetic truth making boasters instead of prayer warriors out of people and that's what they're doing they're boasting to be prophets and saying and they're going to show you a new revelation and they're not they're just wanting a paycheck how strange it was for the people to see the former prime minister wearing sackcloth see daniel humbled himself and he wasn't afraid he wasn't afraid of anybody he wasn't afraid to throw the sackcloth on and sit there and, and ashes and on his knees or prostate or however he was doing it and pray to God for the situation. And neither should anybody else be that. Daniel's prayer is one of the greatest examples of intercession in the Bible. He intercedes for Israel. Israel's not going to do it, right? The people aren't going to do it. Why? Well, they're comfortable. I mean, they're, yeah, they're living in Babylon and they're under the rule of, the, of a, a foreign king. But hey, everything's fine, right? But it's not fine because they've turned from God. So he confesses his own sin and the sins of his people. So he's interceding for them. He reviews Bible history and confesses that the nation has been wicked and God has been righteous to judge them. He knew the warnings Moses had given there in verse 13. And you can also read Leviticus 16. There's a warning there by Moses 
And he knew that he and his people deserved far greater disaster than God had sent them. They deserve more, more punishment, more wrath of God, if you will. So it's wonderful to see Daniel identify himself with his sinning nation, though he himself had not been guilty of these sins, but he included himself. That's what we need to do. Yeah, America has sinned. America needs to repent. Well, we need to intercede for America because America isn't going to do it. America's not going to get on their knees. In fact, I'd be willing to say that only about 10 or 15% of true Christians are the ones that are really praying for America. The rest do not care. They're going with the flow. They're putting blinders on and not paying attention to what's going on. You know... Back probably, well, three presidents ago, it was stated that there was 85 to 89% of America was Christians. So how did that president get elected if that was the case? And all you've seen on TV when it came to his second term, are you going to vote for him? Oh, yeah, we're going to vote for him. Why are you going to vote for him? Well, he's given free stuff. We get free phones. We get free food. You know, why not? Right? You know, so there's where it started. Free, free, free. Except it's not free. Because <laughs> you and I are paying the bill. And we're going to continue to pay the bill as long as the situation is as it is right now. But don't think yourself innocent. Because we're just as guilty. Daniel says, I'm just as guilty. My iniquities and my sins have caused. He didn't blame. He didn't point his finger at his people and say it's their fault. It's not their fault. After confessing his sins and the sins of his people, Daniel begins to pray for Jerusalem. As long as I've been pastor here, Brother Gordon's always prayed for the peace of Jerusalem. Listen to what it says here. O Lord, according to verse 16, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that all are about us. Do you think we're a reproach to America? In many senses, we are. The sad part is people do really not know what true Christianity is. See, they got all these other religions out there and they think that's, that's religion. They think that that's Christianity. It's not. Now, in verse 17, now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Daniel wanted to stand out amongst all the people. Not himself personally, but as God's people. He wanted to stand out above all others. They, he wanted everyone to know who God was. And that he was their God. But yet they made a shambles of their testimony before God and before the people. No doubt he had often prayed for the holy city. In fact... This is one reason why God blessed him and made him to prosper. Turn to Psalm 122. 
Psalm 122 and look at verses 6 through 9. Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9. Listen what the psalmist says here. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy places. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace be within thee, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. That's why Daniel had favor. Who else was praying? Probably nobody. Maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they're the only ones that did. They're the only ones that really came out and said, you know what? We're not going to follow this king. We have a king. God is our king. And we're not going to follow them. And look at the rewards. Daniel was saved from the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was saved from the fiery furnace. You know, we think those things impossible. But yet they happened. And they were true. But why pray for the prosperity of a desolate city? Because God hath promised not only to end the captivity, but also to take the Jews back to their land that they might rebuild the temple. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming very soon. If you're really interested and you have a computer, get on there and, and just go and look and see what Israel's doing concerning the red heifer. They got one that's real close. They may have two, but right now they got one that is so close. Now they have to burn that heifer. This is prophecy. They have to burn it. They have to have the ashes to it. But they have put up and built themselves a mock temple. Not the temple, but a mock temple. And they are practicing sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament times. They're practicing, they're teaching, and they're learning how to do it when the Antichrist comes on the scene. It's interesting. How many people are paying attention to this? Not very many. So in Jeremiah 29, let's turn there. Jeremiah 29. I've always found Jeremiah very interesting, and I feel I feel for Jeremiah what he went through. If you read the book of Lamentations, and you can see what exactly what Jeremiah went through. Jeremiah chapter 29, look at verse 10. For thus saith the Lord. That after 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. They're going to go back. And in the prophecy, they're going back right now today. <laughs> they're returning to Jerusalem. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Now he did. Israel got back. They built, rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the wall. In 1948, they became a nation once again. That isn't the end of it. Because in Revelation, 144,000 are going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they're going to preach. 
They're going to preach the God, blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you, we're not going to go there because it's a little bit lengthy, but in chapter 30 of Jeremiah, you need to go in and read chapter 30, verse 10 through 24. Now turn over to Isaiah 44, 28. Isaiah 44, 28. In Isaiah 44, 28, it says that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So Isaiah there, we see that God promised that Cyrus would permit the Jews to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That's already been done. So Daniel was laying hold of these great promises and turning them into believing prayers. Read the rest of the chapter to see how God answered his prayers there in chapter 9 of Daniel. Also note this. Note how Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9 are similar to those in Ezra chapter 9 and Nehemiah chapter 9 who lived during this time. Nehemiah was given the privilege to rebuild the wall under great persecution. That's where they had a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. That's why we don't take, people ask me all the time. In, in, in fact, I had a fellow at work one time, he says, you know how to get money to build your building? This is when we were across the street. You know how to get money to build your building? Uh, I, I love the man. He was great. He was great to me. And he said, have a rummage sale. He was a Catholic man and, and I, I loved him to death. And, you know, I didn't, I looked past that, but he always, he used to go to the, garage sales and stuff and he'd find the neatest little bibles and he would bring them to me and give them to me he found one i should bring it in it's it's that long and it's that wide and i kid you not and it's about that thick can't hardly read it but he brought it and gave it to me he said here look what i found because he knew i was a pastor but he said have a rummy sale we in one weekend we got over sixty thousand dollars at the church We don't do that because we don't accept money from anybody outside of the membership of New Testament Baptist Church. God's people supply the needs, the tithes, the money that is needed to do the building. That's why they had a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. Because they wanted to help them. And they said, oh no. You know what happens when they help? They want the glory and part of that too. So they, then they have a say how things are to be done. We can't do that. We can't have somebody else come in here and say, well, we helped you do this, helped that. We have to have a say on these things. So all the, all the money comes from God's people in through the church and tithing. So it's something to think about. This is just a little touch, a portion of the 70 years Daniel, but these are prophecies that many things are going to be yet unfolded and things are going to transpire even in our lifetime. If we live long enough to see the rapture, these things will be unfolded. After the rapture, other things are going to be unfolded as well. May God bless his word to your heart today.